Sorry, I did, I did put a bow on since all the fans in the back. Hello, my little summer bunnies. I'm missing one bunny. Terry is, first of all, super tired, but he's still working. He's working late, but he hasn't been able to, like, sleep, like, last night at all. So I feel because it sucks when you can't sleep. I swear, like, I appreciate when I can just nap during the day. Um, I like it when it's, like, a little like not completely dark or completely bright in the dark. I can, maybe I feel safer, you know, but anyway, um, but I'm not afraid of the dark. Well, I do like, sometimes I have the TV on. <laughs> anyway. Pull you guys up here. Hello. Hottie. <laughs> well, you know, it's that time in the month that, like, when my period's, like, leaving, that I get hotter. I swear, it's like, that's what happens to girls when you're ovulating. Like, I don't know, stuff happens. Like, I don't know, your breasts get fuller. You get, like, mm, mm, come on. <laughs> it's funny. But I still have a little bit of cramps right here. But in the meantime, we're on chapter 13. Of course, I wasn't going to call it 13 because I don't like the number 13. But the quote that it starts with is, and I'm going to water from Carol. The secret of success is to start from scratch and keep on scratching. You know, whatever that means. In 1971, the Binions changed the format of the World Series of Poker to a freeze-out, the same format we use today, where all the competitors play until one player remains, the champion. Benny decided there needed to be a real tournament with a real winner for the World Series to attract media interest and ultimately more players to the horseshoe. Benny realized that without the real competition like other sports had, the tournament had little chance to get the widespread publicity he was looking for. It would lack the drama and public interest necessary for success. I'm gonna take his word for it that this is successful. I've never watched it. I, I must have vaguely heard about it at some point. Like, maybe, like, there was, like, something at the thrift or a commercial for it. But I've never watched it. <laughs> no offense to this guy. I'm finding his story, like, a fair, like, a thrill to read. But not my thing. <laughs> mm. But maybe I, maybe I would like it. <laughs> The idea for the freeze out came from the Los Angeles Times journalist Ted Thackeray, who suggested to Benny a winner take all, no limit Texas Hold'em elimination tournament. Thackeray told Benny that he told that he and Jimmy the Greek Snyder, the other Greek. <laughs> there's more Greeks, could get nationwide publicity if the event were an elimination. Benny immediately saw the wisdom of this advice. This 1971 World Series of Poker marked the first poker tournament ever played as a freeze-out. It was decided that the entry fee would be $5,000, winner take all. It, I was pretty excited to try this new concept, and being a friend of the Binions, I was eager to participate. There were only six players for this first tournament. Me, Johnny Moss, Puggy Pearson, Sailor Roberts, Jack Strauss, and Jimmy Casella. Casella was reputed to be connected to one of the New York crime families. 
All of us were Texans except for Puggy and Casella. Fittingly, Moss, who we all thought was the best No Limit player at the time, won the tournament and the $30,000 prize. Interestingly enough, the horseshoe didn't even have a poker room in 1971. The very profitable table games and slot machines were too valuable in the limited space the horseshoe had to spread for the less profitable poker games. They just cleared an area and set up poker tables. After the series, they would drag back the slot machines and the table games and carry on as usual. When they bought the neighboring Mint Casino in 1988, they opened a poker room. It would have stretched my imagination to believe that this modest tournament, the first ever, played by just six players in its inaugural year with no publicity, fanfare, or press contingent, would later turn into an internationally televised event featuring tens of thousands of players, 50 plus events, and a combined prize pool that would exceed $100 million. I don't think anyone could have seen that coming. In 1972, the Binions raised the buy-in to $10,000, and we had the same six players from the year before, plus Slim and a man named Roger Van Osdale. Actually, there were 12 players signed up, but with the cash game so good, only eight of us played. The series that year got the interest of national television, and that changed everything. For me in particular, that really changed things. Slim won the tournament, which was the best thing that could have happened to poker. But there's a story behind the story. I probably could have won the World Series that year. But given the circumstances of my life, it was not something I wanted to do. When we got three-handed with me, Puggy, and Slim, the last players left, I was presented with a problem I didn't want to face, the media. All of a sudden, here came these TV cameras and reporters to cover the world championship and the results would be splashed over newspapers and media everywhere. I got real uncomfortable about that. Media coverage was great for the World Series and for poker, but it was the last thing I needed. People back in Longworth, particularly my mom and the family, didn't know what I did for a living. I was afraid of the publicity that winning this event would bring and the terrible shame it would bring to my family. They didn't know I was a gambler back in Texas where I lived at that time. I had concocted all these stories that I was an insurance salesman or I was in the oil business and so forth. When we stopped and took a break, I pulled Puggy and Slim aside and said, I don't want to win this thing because I don't want all the publicity. I don't want it either, Puggy said, but Slim who loved attention said, I do. That's when we said, let's just let Slim win it. We came right out and started playing crazy so we could let Slim win. Slim, a natural showman, got to where he was putting on a big show, hamming it up and showing his cards to the crowd. He was playing the audience and clowning around rather than just playing his cards and getting on with the game. With all Slim's showboating and entertaining, the key TV cameras ate it up. I got really irritated with Slim's antics but I wasn't the only one. Jimmy the Greek and Jack Binion were watching us, and they got pretty agitated too. Finally, they stopped the game and told us to come back to the office. They closed the door, and Jack got right to it. It's obvious what you guys are doing. You're going to cause a big scandal here. You just can't do this. But Jack, I said, I just don't want the publicity. 
I kept thinking about all the shame this would bring on my family. All of those TV cameras and media started showing me as a participant in a Las Vegas poker tournament, particularly if I won it. We talked it over a bit and Jack saw where I was coming from. Jack was a fellow Texan, so he had a pretty good understanding of the Bible Belt and what I was talking about. Okay, Doyle, we'll let you withdraw and you can keep the money you have now. Slim and Puggy were agreeable. By this point, we had lost enough chips to Slim where he was up close to us. So the three of us made a deal. I withdrew from the tournament, citing stomach problems, and left the horseshoe, leaving Puggy and Slim to play it out. Then they played on the square once I withdrew. Slim ended up beating Puggy as we had hoped. He became the 1972 WSOP champion. Slim was the perfect spokesman and his victory probably changed the course of poker. He hit the talk show circuit and gave the game a boost of legitimacy, taking the game out of smoky back rooms and into America's living rooms. Suddenly, the horseshoe and the World Series of Poker were on the map, and everything took off from there. Over the years, Slim ended up with 11 appearances on the Johnny Carson show, and three more on 60 Minutes. I believe that without Slim's victory, the World Series would never have advanced to the popularity it has reached today and likely would have faded away over the years. He really started people talking about poker. I could never be Amarillo Slim Preston and make all the outrageous claims and be on t the TV shows and do what he did. The first TV show I was on, I was scared to death. But Slim just loved all the attention. The Binions, of course, also had a lot to do with the eventual success of poker tournaments, as did the group of us who decided to play in the original WSOP. They organized and ran the tournaments in the first place, giving impetus to the history that would follow. Afterward, I told my family about how I withdrew from the tournament, and they said if I had consulted them, they would have been happy if I had won. Louise, Cheryl, and Doyla knew I was playing, but the neighbors didn't. In hindsight, I would have liked to be the winner back in 1972. That would have given me three world championships, but I never really look back on it with regret because Slim did so much for poker. Back then, we didn't attach much importance to the World Series because it was still in its infancy. It didn't mean a whole lot to me or Puggy, certainly not what that championship means today. Well, don't worry, I said, they're going to have it every year and I'll win one of them. I really felt like I was a tier above everybody at that point and wasn't worried about it. In the 1973 World Series of Poker, Puggy Pearson defeated 12 other players to win the championship and the winner-take-all prize of $130,000. I didn't get very far that year, but while I was impressed with the old Puggy, I wasn't surprised either. Not only did Puggy win the tournament, he did it convincingly. He broke most of the players himself. It was a terrific tribute to Puggy's ability that he won the championship playing No Limit Hold'em because like the other players in Vegas at the time, he wasn't an adept at no limit. He was a limit player. However, I knew the real story. Puggy was simply a tremendous card player, highly competitive, and he had a great feel for the game, like a tiger in the jungle. He was blessed with natural instincts. Here was a guy who had a sixth grade education and two illiterate parents grew up dirt poor and didn't know odds and probabilities. Yet, he had this terrific instinct that made him great. He didn't know why he did some of the things he did, but they would be the right things to do. Puggy was the best poker player in town when I arrived in Las Vegas. 
All the big games were built around him, but he was not skilled at no limit Texas Hold'em, the main game. So while he had a good run at the World Series of Poker, I liked playing with him in the no limit side games away from my table. Puggy was on a different level than his competitors. He just ate them up. His explanation for why there were so few good poker players compared to him was pure Puggies. Poker has a language all its own, but you don't expect most folks to understand it any more than you expect them to understand Egyptian. Jimmy the Greek Snyder, Binion's spokesman and PR director for the World Series of Poker, was absolutely amazed at Puggy's performance in the main event. The man's a machine, the Greek said. Snyder, widely known later as an analyst on the CBS sports program, the NFL Today, did a great job for Benny. He was able to promote the coverage of the series nationwide, a feat that was greatly helped by Slim's year-long stint promoting the series after he won the title in 1972. Actually, it was Snyder who was responsible for my nickname, Texas Dolly, at least indirectly, when he was writing a column in the Las Vegas Sun about the World Series of Poker, he always identified me as Texas Doyle. At the time, I was trying to avoid publicity because of the stigma attached to gambling back in Texas. Jimmy and I became pretty good friends and I asked him not to use my last name. He agreed, saying Texas Doyle would work fine. When we were together, Jimmy called me Doily. Another writer overheard Doily and thought he was saying Dolly and started referring to me as Texas Dolly. The name caught on, and when the Associated Press picked it up, it more or less became official. I would be Texas Dolly from that point on. <laughs> and that is the end of chapter 13. So I guess at that point, it's like becoming a big deal. I'm trying to remember when I first, I'm trying to remember when I first heard of poker or like, I must have saw some people. Why would you? Goose Hunter be in trouble. No, this has to be. This has to be another. This has to be another glitch. Error. Yeah. I'm like, what did he say? He doesn't say anything bad ever. Yeah, he said beautiful. Like, <laughs> thank you, actually. That's very sweet. Oh, okay. Anyway, I think our papers are something guys do, but like more like old school guys. I feel like do guys nowadays play poker or do they just play like video games? You you be going to the pizza places and have those playing that Mortal Kombat, playing that the the Pac Man, <laughs> right? <laughs> Of the arcade. Chapter 14. I've learned in poker there is a fine line between genius and insanity. Poker online. Oh yeah. I guess that's I guess that's popular. You know what I saw they have um uh, as a game you could play is like um jigsaw puzzles. Like on your phone. I thought that was cute. <laughs> like you could make like a cat and find the piece. <laughs> In my early gambling days, I often heard about a renowned gambler, pool hustler, and con artist named Titanic Thompson, who had an even flashier reputation than Minnesota Fats. 
I heard all sorts of colorful stories about Titanic and his exploits and couldn't wait to meet him. Titanic was hardly a role model unless you were an aspiring con artist. But he certainly was a legend. A Dallas writer friend named Carlton Stowers, who wrote a classic book about him, The Unsinkable Titanic Thompson, told me that not only was T a world-class con man, he was an expert at most everything he undertook. Golf, pool, dice, pistols, rifles, even pinching pennies. He was also a national skeet shooting champion, a world champion horseshoe pitcher, and a sensational bowler. As a sports professional, had he devoted himself, he could have been in several halls of fame. See, like, whenever I see stuff like this, and it's not this guy's fault, but if they're from, like, really, like, old school times, like, I do assume a little, like, that there's some racism involved. Like, how could you say someone is the best if they couldn't compete against Black people, you know? Like, like the idea that there was a time where Black people and white people didn't play baseball together is, like, so insane to me. But that was even probably after this. Um, It's like that show I was watching last night, but I ended up falling asleep like because they they jump around from like different years it's it's actually very clever because it they tries to show you how it ties back into uh more current things and and everywhere in between you know from you know from the beginning to now but because of that like i didn't like i once try to pay attention but then i would started getting in like the timelines messed up so i fell asleep <laughs> No, Goose Hunter didn't say anything. He didn't say anything bad. He's a sweetie. I don't, I don't think... I think he just got timed out for a minute, right? 300... How long is that? Goose Hunter, we miss you. Okay. He could do more things better than anybody I've ever known. Well, you know, I don't really... I don't really think, though, that, like, I mean, obviously, credit where it's due on doing other things, but, like, being a con artist, that's not, like, a skill. Like, I think that crime, for the most part, like, the people that, like, you're away with crime, it's really, be it's not because they're smarter than other people, although people like to credit themselves like they are. It's because they realize, like, it's like that old saying, like, there's, a, like, a certain they can't catch all crime. They don't have, like, the resources. Uh, it's not that because you outsmarted them by, like, stealing something from the store. It's that, you know, and a lot of girls would do that. They'd be like, oh, I, mean, I feel so powerful because I just robbed this store and they don't know. And for, like, what? A pair of pants? Who cares? Not that any of it's good, but I just mean, like, yeah, you're so cool and badass. There he is. <laughs> anyway, so... Um, but I, I just feel like, cause I feel like my almost uncle was like that. And, um, he, I think people do that stuff online. There's so much fraud and then to tell themselves, like, they're so smart, like it's some kind of a skill when all there really is, is just banking on the fact that somebody will not put the focus on you, but if they do, they can catch you. I mean, maybe not always, but literally my almost uncle, I felt so bad because like they were supposed to take me to SeaWorld when I was 13. I mean, maybe I was 12. Like one day I'll tell you about this trip because it was so horrible what happened to me that, that summer. But he would steal from like everywhere it seemed. And he went into this like gift shop in SeaWorld and took like something stupid like cards, you know, because obviously he couldn't just like take like a giant whale, but like some good like, cards from the table. And I didn't want them like, 
it made me feel sick. It, like I just right away, like, I didn't feel like I was getting something. It felt wrong and bad. And I didn't want them. It's like, oh, I was, I was gotten for Stella. Like, and so I, so I, I picture like these thieves and I pictured like him and I'm like, you know, and also I was a crackhead. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> T's life was surrounded by an aura of legend and myth, but I know many of them were true. They say he played Ben Hogan right-handed and beat him, then played Byron Nelson left-handed and beat him. Think about that. No bigger golf legends than those two. I never said he could beat Hogan and Nelson all the time, but he was equally good right or left-handed, which was better than rare. It was unique. Yeah, people said they saw a lot of things before, you know, everyone had cell phones with cameras inside. Yeah, yeah, there was a lot more alien sightings back then, too, coincidentally. If he didn't, if he hadn't made so much money and had so much fun hustling, he would have been one of the leading professionals on the PGA Tour. Stowers marveled at T's athletic ability. He said, and he was right, that T could have made a world of money legitimately, but he preferred hustling. Stowers joked that it was plastic playing cards that put a lot of gamblers out of business. The old bicycle cards were cardboard and could be easily marked. You could rough up an edge or scratch them with your fingernail, for instance. That was T. Nothing he ever did was on the square. It's <laughs> fake aliens in Vegas. <laughs> yeah, like people will record like their dog taking a poop, but like not seeing aliens, that's not worthy. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> T sashayed in and out of Texas, but was not a Texan. He rarely used his real name, Alvin Clarence Thomas, perhaps because he never really knew his father, the elder Thomas, a form farmer of sorts in Arkansas preferred gambling to farming and disappeared before T was a year old. You can't tell stories about gamblers without including Titanic Thompson. When I was a young gambler, he was still dazzling us all with his creative gimmicky bets. T was the absolute master of the cunning proposition and he had an endless string of tricks he would use to separate gamblers from their money. One of my favorite T stories was about the time he met Nick the Greek Dan Dandalus. It was at an airport and they recognized one another right off and shook hands. They were standing there talking and T said, I hear you've got a lot of gambling in you, Nick. Yeah, I think I got as much gamble as anybody who ever lived, Nick countered. T reached in his pocket, pulled out a $15,000 bundle of cash, tossed it on the floor and said, I'll flip you for this. Nick just smiled, pulled out his bankroll, counted out $15,000 and pitched it down beside T's. You're on. T plucked a two-headed coin from his pocket and flipped it. Call it. Head said Nick. T reached up, grabbed the coin on the way down, stuck it in his pocket, and gushing with mock admiration said, Damn, Nick, you will gamble, won't you? Of course, if Nick had called tails, T would have let the two-headed coin fall to the ground and snatch up the $30,000. Different versions of that story and another, the watermelon story, are still going around. It was in Hot Springs, Arkansas, 
that he supposedly pulled off his famous watermelon scam. Mmm, watermelon. <laughs> Maybe for the first time, he was staying with a bunch of other gamblers at one of those old hotels where folks gathered on the porch in the late afternoon. Early one day, he drove out in the country and found a farmer with a truckload of watermelons. He offered the guy $100 or so to count the watermelons, give him the exact number, and then at a designated time, drive into town with the truckload of melons intact. He went back to the hotel, plopped down in a rocking chair on the front porch, and was shooting the bull with his cronies when the watermelon truck came rolling down the street. How many watermelons do you reckon are in that truck? He asked innocently. His pals were notorious for making bets like that, and they quickly took the bait. Everybody put up a thousand dollars and guessed at the number of melons, the closest to winning the entire pot. They stopped the guy, then bought and counted the melons. Naturally, T won. The only person happier than T was the watermelon farmer. Once T bet a bunny, he could throw a dime atop a multi-story building. Impossible, the guy said, backing up his belief with a $500 bet. Tiki walked across the street, bought an orange, poked the dime into it, curled the orange atop the building, and scooped up the $500. It was in Chicago one winter, according to another story, that he bet a bundle he could drive a golf ball 500 yards. He covered all the bets, loaded up his clubs, drove to a nearby beach, and hit a golf ball that was last seen skidding across frozen Lake Michigan. Another story I loved about him involved a West Texas road sign on the Big Spring Highway, alerting motorists that it was eight miles to Midland. He drove out in the middle of the night, dug up the sign, and moved it two miles closer to town. He and his gambler friends were driving along the road the next day, and he purposely avoided glancing at the sign. How far do you think it is to the Midland city limits, he wondered aloud. His buddies, who had just spotted the sign, proposed a $1,000 bet on who could guess closest. They said eight miles. T said six. And of course, he won that bet too. I'm told T also pulled off the same bet near Evansville, Indiana. When talking about guys like Titanic, you have to wonder where fact ended and fiction began. He was up in years when I first met him back in Texas, but I heard about him all my life. He was a daring and dangerous person who had reputedly on separate occasions killed five men when they tried to rob him. Like most gamblers, he had a disregard for his own life. When someone approached him with a gun drawn, like during a robbery attempt, he would grab his heart and tumble to the ground fake a heart attack, and reach for a pistol he carried in a shoulder holster. Then he'd come up shooting. I never dreamed how much that story would help me one terrifying night many years later. Oh, oh, <laughs> the shoulder holster. I have a shoulder holster. I think I showed you guys once. See, I'm thinking of like all my videos, especially after um, John just bought me a hard drive. So I was able to, because my other computer was full from recording these. Um, but, you know, I lost that channel and I have all the shows, um, that one and all the other ones. Um, so um, I was thinking it would be fun if I could, you know, slowly start up uploading them somewhere. Just that I, 
I, it take, would take so long that I want it to be somewhere that they would at least last a little while. So every time I did that on YouTube, I'd get a few up and then, well, also they have a limit. I know at least on YouTube, um, in a day, you can only get like 10 videos or something. <laughs> and you know, I have so many. I lost my page. Okay. I finally met T in the 60s. And something Stowers told me proved dead on. Had he been an actor, he said, he wouldn't have received an Oscar award. T was always up to something, but you could never tell by the way he proposed bets or suggested ideas that near that nearby gamblers took him up on. Like with the watermelons or the signs, T had the situation set up from the get-go. He always had a plan. And the angles worked out. In one respect, T was no different from the celebrities he hustled. He had an ego as big as the ingenious con games he invented. He won millions of dollars in schemes that would stagger the imagination, Stower said. I can't understand the people. How do I put Like, okay, I'm sure, like, everybody is different. Like, if there could be people that play a certain game because they feel like they're good at it and that they could have better odds of winning than just, you know, a, a random draw, like putting it all on black. I bet they're the people that might think that they're getting a sign from Jesus to put it all on black, uh, you know, and those are their own type. And then there might be people that are like, well, if I win, I'll stay alive. If not, you know, I'll go drop in a river and, you know, wrestle an alligator. But, it, like, the general people that like to gamble, I wonder, I mean, I'm sure we have a little of that in all of us, right? Like, a little bit of the thrill, I could understand. Um, Like, you know, like those mystery boxes and like, oh, what am I going to get? Like, they do that with, like, makeup and stuff. Sometimes, like, um... Some sites used to do that like once a year and like, oh, Black Friday mystery box. So obviously there's a little bit of a, th but then people like to know like, yeah, but what part is guaranteed? Like I'll, I'll, like maybe I could get a super high value, but I'll at least get something, right? So then it makes me think maybe for some people, it's actually the fear of losing it potentially that makes it exciting. But then why is that a good feeling? Isn't that just like a stressful feeling? Because you'd almost think it would be correlated to being risky with other things, especially like, like cheating on your relationship. Like, oh, if I got caught, I'll lose everything. You know, I'll break the person's heart, like the guy who loves me or something. But I don't think it is correlated with that. Like, I, I think there are plenty of people like that gamble, but they wouldn't cheat or you know, like he's had this one guy that he was jogging, like he wasn't risky with his life and doing drugs or anything. And yet some people did. So I, I wonder what it is. Maybe it makes them feel powerful if they did win. Like, oh, imagine how special I would feel. And I can understand that because I used to enter sweepstakes. So I wanted to feel lucky and what it felt like. I was playing in the World Series of Poker. I would wear a hat to cover my eyes. What? <laughs> what did you see your own? Oh, you mean like if people could like read by your eyes? I don't know. I think it would be kind of fun if somebody could tell if somebody was lying. You know, like get like a professional lie detector in there. <laughs> Where were we? T didn't always get the best of it. As witnessed by one of the clever golf wagers that backfired on him in the 60s, T and a well-known Texas gambler named Ace Darnell took pro golfer Ray Floyd, then a young unknown, to El Paso to play a gambler named Gene Fisher, one of the best amateurs in the state at that time. Floyd would soon become a major force on the PGA Tour. And one day, a member of the World 
Golf Hall of Fame. The El Paso guys acted unimpressed with the young Floyd and told T and Ace, we got a Mexican kid out there on the course driving that tractor that can beat your guy. If you'll give our kid a couple of shots aside, winking at his pal, T accepted the bet. Well, the Mexican kid was Lee Trevino. Early on, Floyd was not playing at the top of his game, and Trevino beat him handily. After two days, T and Ace were $18,000 losers, and they were now playing even. They demanded another game. Rising to the challenge, Floyd shot a 65 and beat Trevino by two strokes. T got half his money back, but that was it. The disgruntled Dallas Hustlers stuck around for a few days playing the locals $100 and $200 a hole and only recovered some of their losses. Back in the 60s, robbing gamblers was an everyday occurrence and he wasn't immune to those threats. However, a hijacker took his life in his hands when he went up against T. One night, a bandit caught him without his pistol and took his bankroll. The next day, there was a knockout, a knock at his door. To T's amazement, there stood the robber. The guy said he hadn't realized just who it was that he'd robbed. He come to apologize and return the money. I played golf with T toward the end when he was in his 70s and I really got to know him well. He couldn't hit the ball more than a couple hundred yards, but he still had that magical touch around the greens. I couldn't believe his chipping ability. He tried to teach me how he did it, but it was a futile effort. You're good enough, he finally said, and gave up on me. A few years before he died, I finally accepted his invitation to go out to his house in Fort Worth to visit. T was going to teach me some of the math on hand matchups. He said I could take the knowledge to Las Vegas, win a lot of money, and give him a percentage of the profits. Turned out I had done all the math before and already knew everything he showed me. While a genius in many respects, he was not a great poker player, at least when compared with the top professionals. He cheated at poker sometimes, but we let him do it to keep him playing. Why? Because he was entertaining on the one hand and often a loser on the other. Shortly before his death, he was living in a rest home north of Fort Worth. When the weather was good and he was feeling okay, he'd get the male nurses to take him over to a nearby pitch and putt court where he'd hustle anybody he could find for a couple of bucks. After beating his pitch and putters, handily, he'd announce, young fella, you've just been hustled by the king himself, Titanic Thompson. In his book, Stowers recounted a story about T at the time of his death, a story that said worlds about this guy and his reputation. Word of his passing spread quickly across the Tennyson Municipal Course in Dallas, where for years he had perfected many of his golf scams and fleeced countless people with his gimmicky propositions. A teenage caddy came racing out in a golf cart to report the news to a foursome of gamblers at a green on the back nine. The players paused to remove their hats and caps and pay their respects. What a shame. We've lost the greatest and craziest hustler that ever lived. One of the old timers said, another sidled over to the young caddy and said, you ever know Titanic Thompson's son? No, sir, can't say that I did. 
Well, you say he's dead. Well, that's what I was told. Well, son, let me say this to you. I knew old T for a lot of years. Likely he is dead. But well, take my advice and don't go betting any of your money on it. <laughs> I hadn't been in Vegas, but about a year when Titanic died. It was 1974 and he was 82 years old, scamming to the very end, losing a gambling legend like T made gambling a little less fun and a lot less entertaining. There was just nobody like him. And that is the end of the chapter and book two. Book three is called Las Vegas. I think we can read a little on uh, chapter 15. Let's see. Las Vegas. Viva Las Vegas. <laughs> my water for a second points for looking cool but you lose every hit but not like that show poker face i hope they re i hope that they bring it back i like that show wish you could tell the liars a successful job is when you don't know if you are working or playing. In 1973, the pressure of trying to make a living playing poker in Texas became too great. I knew I was one of the best players on the circuit, but the games had dried up and it was difficult to find action. The government had imposed laws making it illegal to cross state lines to gamble. You could even go to jail for possessing a deck of cards. That made it risky to go to Alabama or even Oklahoma to play poker. I've got to make a living and it's getting harder and harder, I told Luis. I've been going to Las Vegas regularly and I felt it was time to make it permanent. So we decided to make the move. The Horseshoe had already hosted four World Series tournaments all of which I played in. And I had also played plenty at the Golden Nugget, the Dunes, where the big action was. So I was hardly a stranger to the town. After undergraduate schooling on Exchange Avenue <laughs> and graduate college on the Texas circuit, it really was time for postgraduate poker studies <laughs> at the gambling capital of the world. He had a motorhome and a car, or we had, and we packed all our belongings and kids and headed west in the dead of summer. Todd celebrated his fourth birthday. On the road. We passed through Amarillo and spent a memorable night with Amarillo Slim on his ranch, where Doyla got bit by one of his pet horses. Luis was not overjoyed with the move, but she didn't say much. She was certainly smart enough to see the problems with staying in Texas, and while she hated to leave our home, she was excited about finding a nice house in Vegas with three kids we needed lots of space, and so we settled in a beautiful 5,500 square foot home on the east side. Most of the neighborhood children were soon hanging out there, and Luis adopted a couple of them because their living conditions were deplorable. She quickly became known as the mother of the neighborhood. At the time, all the poker games were played at the Golden Nugget in downtown Las Vegas. And I did most of my playing there. I was familiar with the Nugget because in the late 60s, when I used to come out to Las Vegas and play, that's where I went. 
actually, in the early years, it was the only legal poker room in Nevada. It was a sawdust joint, just like you see in the old westerns, with red wallpaper, sawdust on the floor, and a bunch of old-time gamblers playing cards. Bill Boyd ran the poker room at the Nugget from 1946 when it opened to 1982 when he retired and was replaced by Eric Dratch. Bill always ran a good game. I think his salary was 18% of the profit the card room made, so he really promoted poker. He hasn't gotten enough credit for being one of the main contributors to poker. However, he's largely responsible for keeping honest poker going in Las Vegas back in the early days before the series. He made the rake reasonable so the poker players would get a fair shake. Though there was cheating in other card rooms when more began to open in Las Vegas, Bill didn't put up with much foolishness. He was old school. In fact, he shot a guy. Nick Simpson, who controlled the cheating around town, mostly in the casino games at the time, there wasn't any mob presence in the poker rooms. Nick tried to move in on Bill's poker games, but Bill Boyd ordered him to stay out of his card room. Nick didn't do it. They argued and Bill got a gun and shot him outside in the alley. He got him right in the rear end. I don't know if that's where he was aiming, but I reckon Nick got off easy. Bill probably wasn't prosecuted back in those days. Like Texas, many things were handled between people without too much outside interference. I was an outsider in 1973 and didn't exactly know how to handle the blatant cheating that was going on. But eventually, after I had lost a lot of money trying to overcome the problem, I learned to work around it. While Bill Boyd kept the nugget pretty clean, it was impossible to stop all of it. So you had to protect yourself, especially in the other card rooms where cheating was more open. If there was cheating going on, you could feel pretty quickly that things were out of the ordinary. You could just tell. When real big money was involved, you knew somebody was going to try to get it by any means they can. It's just human nature. I learned that a long time ago, and I always stayed alert to the danger signals. I learned about different ways people mark cards, hold cards out, collude with each other, put peeps in the ceiling, run out cold decks, and all kinds of different cheating methods. I had to keep the lines of communication open with certain people to learn about stuff like that. If you didn't keep up to date with what the cheaters were doing, you'd be at a big disadvantage and be more prone to getting cheated. Some guys showed me things out of friendship or I paid them for the information. You just needed to be aware of what was going on if you had any kind of big money at stake. Despite the problems with cheating, the games were easy and I was playing and winning just about every day. After playing against all the tough no-limit players in the Texas games, I could hardly believe how easy the games were in Las Vegas. I was so much better at no-limit poker than anybody in Vegas. It was like picking strawberries. I mean, there were some good card players like Sid Wyman, Puggy Pearson, Red Wynn, Joe Bernstein, Bill Boyd, Nate Lanett, uh, they were all really top-notch, but they didn't understand how to play No Limit. They were limit players, and there's a world of difference between No Limit and Limit. In Limit Poker, betting was structured, and you could only bet what was allowed for the game. But when it came to No Limit, where you could bet as much money as you had on the table, they didn't understand the nuances required to be a top player. I didn't play limit games back then. There was no reason to. If there wasn't a no limit game being spread, 
I just go out and play some golf or go home. While I was playing a lot at the Golden Nugget, it didn't attract the high rollers like the strip casinos did. So eventually, when poker games were introduced to the dunes, we played there frequently. I remember Sarge Ferris saying that when he started up his car every day, it just went straight to the dunes. It drove itself. That's where the biggest poker games were held. The change-ins, what we call buy-ins today, ranked from $10,000 up to $100,000, depending upon the players. That was big money back then, equivalent to five times as much today. These high-stakes games were spread at the dunes because the principal owners of the hotel were poker players, and they wanted to attract the high action to the games. Wyman was one of the players, along with Bob Race, Charlie Rich, Todd Durlocker, and Major Riddle, the majority shareholder of the Dunes, until he lost his stake in the hotel playing poker. Riddle was a really bad player, what we called a producer. He'd just hand his money away at the table. One guy that did did know how to play no limit was my friend Crandall Addington and we tangled pretty good one night in a game that neither one of us will ever forget. I had just moved to Vegas from Texas and was trying to promote Hold'em because the local pros hadn't played the game much and weren't very good at it. Johnny Moss had also moved to Vegas and was running the card room at the Aladdin Hotel and Casino. I walked into the card room one day and saw a six-handed hold'em game going on with some of the biggest high rollers in town. Lots of money was on the table, so I took a seat to get my share of it. This game kept going for 45 days. All the hold'em players in the South had heard about it and were flocking to Vegas to play. After several days, Crandall and I were the two big winners. We had all our money on the table when I got dealt two sevens. Crandall had two kings. He raised and I called. The flop was K of... Hold on. Clubs. Clubs. <laughs> I remember. <laughs> uh, four of hearts and two of diamonds. Crandall bet and I raised him, hoping to push him out of the pot. He just called hoping to beat me in a big pot. The fourth card was a seven, giving me a set of sevens. Crandall bet again. I raised him, confidently believing my three sevens were good. Crandall called. The river card was the last seven in the deck. Crandall checked. I bet, and he moved in. I had the nuts and busted him, sending my toughest opponent back to Texas. There was almost a million dollars in that pot, and the old timers told me it was the biggest pot in Las Vegas history at that point. There was another great thing about playing in Las Vegas. It was relatively safe. The atmosphere in a controlled gambling environment was appealing after all I'd been through in Texas. I didn't have to worry so much about being hijacked, robbed, or hassled by cops. It was unbelievable. I didn't need to carry a gun anymore. And when I won money, I knew I could walk out the door with it. And unlike Texas, where the cops could raid the game at any time or hijackers could come in with shotguns, the cops in Las Vegas actually protected the games. Now that was a feeling of security I never experienced before. Every day I played, I almost had to pinch myself to get reminded that this was for real. If I had known how much easier it was to be a professional poker player in Las Vegas than on the Texas circuit, I would have moved a lot sooner than I did. But I didn't, and it was all because of Johnny Moss and an incident that had occurred some 25 years earlier. I knew Moss had spent some time in Vegas, and I would ask him about the poker games. You guys don't want to go out there with all the bad people and everything, Moss used to tell me. Sailor and Slim, when the subject came up, he painted pictures of us getting killed within a few months if we were lucky to survive that long. Shaking his head to the side, he allowed as to how he was lucky to survive himself 
in the treacherous Las Vegas environment. Well, that wasn't the whole story, not by any means. Later, we found out what really happened, and it had to do with a less than wholesome habit of Johnny's. Monsters ran Johnny out of Vegas after they caught him cheating in the late 1940s. I'm surprised they didn't kill him. And they probably would have if he hadn't been rescued. The episode occurred shortly after the notorious gangster Bugsy Single was killed on June 20th, 1947. A Chicago mobster named Gus Grunbaum was sent into Vegas to take over the Flamingo Hotel and Casino. He later became associated with the Tropicana and the Riviera as well. Greenbaum was a poker player, and the Flamingo hosted a big poker game where Johnny was a regular. Despite our age difference, about 25 years, Johnny and I became friends later in Texas. But the one thing I didn't like about him was his tendency to cheat. In those early days, in the 40s and 50s, it was almost acceptable. Everybody was looking for an edge and honestly often got trampled in the process. Or honesty often got trampled in the process. Even in Greenbaum's game, a guy you wouldn't want to mess around with, Johnny, was not one to give honesty an edge. In what amounted to an outlandish scheme, Johnny posted a couple of cronies in a room above the table with a sophisticated mirror device to read his opponent's cards and relay that information back to him. Moss won millions before they got suspicious and finally nailed him. Apparently, Greenbaum's henchmen caught Johnny's guys hiding in the ceiling. Once exposed, Johnny took the blame. Listen, these guys work for me. It was my deal, Moss said. They were just doing what I told them to do. Just turn them loose. Greenbaum took the bait and released everyone but Johnny, who they presumably had different plans for. That most likely wouldn't have been too good for Johnny's future survival. But once freed, Johnny's guys went straight to their car for shotguns, and then they returned and threw down on everybody. They backed Greenbaum and his guys away from the table and escorted Johnny to safety. He got away, but the word was out, don't ever come back to this town. Mob influence was still strong in those days, and Johnny's exploits were not quickly forgotten. So he stayed out of Vegas for another decade or so to keep from getting killed. Greenbaum was not one to forgive and forget, and Moss knew it. But neither were the mob bosses if they felt things weren't right. In a fate similar to Bugsy Siegel, who had run afoul of his mob bosses back east, Greenbaum and his wife were murdered at their home in Phoenix in 1958, their throats cut, reportedly because Gus had been stealing mob money that had been skimmed from the proceeds of Vegas casinos. Years later, when Moss decided to give Vegas another shot, many of the original mobsters like Greenbaum and his cronies had long since died out and he felt it was safe to return. I wasn't surprised when I learned about Moss's exploits in Las Vegas, and especially not when I learned that the devious old fox had been knocking Las Vegas because he wanted us to stay in Texas where we could keep the games going. When I wasn't playing poker in the card rooms around Las Vegas, I was often out at the golf course trying to win money. Just like at the poker tables, people would try to get your money any way they could, fair or foul. Soon after I arrived in Las Vegas, a couple of mentors, quotes, privileged me with a lesson, a quite valuable, if extremely expensive one, willing student that I was. I learned that golf wasn't always the gentlemanly sport it was reputed to be. I dubbed my tutorial the $300,000 milkshake caper. Mmm, milkshakes. I love those banana milkshakes from Five Guys. <laughs> With the real ice cream. Okay, so what happened? I was playing a guy named Billy at the Old Sahara Golf Course, and he was a slightly better golfer than I was. 
he was spotting me a stroke and a half each nine holes. And I beat him on the front line. Front nine. He put a double press on me on the back and I accepted it. As we made the turn, Billy's friend Elmo disappeared for a few minutes and reappeared with a chocolate milkshake for me. I was even par at that point and birdied the first two holes on the back side. Billy wanted to press again, which I thought was a little strange since I hadn't used any of my stroke holes yet. My first stroke hole was in fact the 12th, a long par four, which I hit in regulation. As I lined up my birdie putt, I started getting dizzy. I four putted the hole, then proceeded to bogey or double bogey the remaining six holes. It didn't take me long to figure out what had happened. I never learned what they put in that milkshake, but I knew they had spiked it with something and that it cost me more than $300,000. At least I learned my lesson. Never again did I drink anything on the golf course that I didn't bring with me or know the source from which it sprung. Meanwhile, the World Series had been growing steadily and getting more publicity around the country. Slim was doing his thing on the talk show circuit, and as magazines and newspapers were covering the event, people started following the game. By now, thousands of newspapers across the country, big and small, printed pieces on the World Series of Poker. It was a good thing for poker because it brought players, but it was also a good thing for me because it made poker more respectable in the eyes of the public. I became less self-conscious about being a gambler, at least as far as folks back home were concerned. That laid the groundwork for me making a more serious run at the championship. I played again in 1974 and 1975, but didn't get as far as I would have liked. But that was to be expected in a tournament. One bad run of cards or one unlucky draw and your tournament is over. It isn't like cash games where you can reach into your pockets and keep playing. Moss won in 1974 for his third championship, and Sailor won in 1975. I took special notice of Sailor's victory because it now meant two-thirds of my old road partners, Slim and Sailor, had won the championship. I started looking at the World Series differently. It took on a different meaning to me. I felt I was the best no-limit player, yet I hadn't won the championship and the recognition that went with it. With Sailor now winning the title, that reality struck home to me. What I really liked about the World Series, though, as did other top players, were the side games, where high-rolling gamblers and poker players would come to play with us. The cash would get distributed pretty good around that time of the year, and I got my share of it. I kept winning steadily and building my bankroll. But in the cash games, away from the World Series, there was a different side of poker unfolding, and it wasn't necessarily so pretty. This was away from the TV cameras and the media coverage and the public eye. Las Vegas was still a mob town, and you had to be careful how you navigated the waters. In particular, I'm talking about one of the most dangerous men I've ever met, maybe the most dangerous. And that's where we will end it for tonight, the end of chapter 15. We will pick it up chapter 16 tomorrow. I thought that was very interesting stuff tonight. I love hearing about the old, like, mafia times. A good cliffhanger. Yeah, I wonder who he's talking about. Maybe. Hi. So, I'm glad, thank you, thank you, Goose. I'm sorry that you got timed out for nothing. Um, I still have steak from Butcher Block, so I'm going to make it out for the show and hopefully not burn it. But you know what my thing is? Like, when I'm, like, cooking something, I get so bored. I'm like, I'm wasting my life here. Like, I have to go... Like, I'll get, uh, usually, like, I could get on my phone and chat with you guys. Like, you'll be writing me, like, oh, it's a great show. And I might be like, the little things, like, what's good? <laughs> or something. Like, I might check, like, oh, let's see if it's something I ordered at the shit. And then, 
what's that smell? Like, oh, I burned it. I don't know, like, how to, like, focus and be, like, to stay put and watch the food. I feel like, Dwight, what do you do? Do you just, like, add spices? Like, a little, like, do you, do you actually find it, like, more entertaining than paint drying? Like, watching <laughs> your life take by? It's, because I'm sure some people like to cook, but it's not fun. <laughs> but I do like to eat. So <laughs> I do it for that part. Wish me luck tonight. I'll, I'll show you when I'm done. Um, and then maybe I'm, I'm looking for like a movie or something, something to watch. So you're saying we are the reason you're food. Yes. Yes, exactly. <laughs> no. The, my, my impatience says my, uh, <laughs> like my inability to pay attention. <laughs> it's not your fault. But you're a very cute distraction. I'll try, I'll try to focus though. I guess I, I guess there's like a limit where it's like, it's going good. It's going fine. You think you got it, but you don't because once it starts the burn process, there's like a little char and then there's like char, 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 like <clears throat> I, can't, <clears throat> I can't eat this. Like it tastes like, you know, like, <laughs> just like sh ash, but, um, that I find to happen very quickly, like slow, slow, slow. And then sh it's burnt. So yeah, I'll also wish you luck today. <laughs> anyway, I love you so much. I'm very much looking forward to this. I almost spread them. Like we're not only been time of the month being over. It should be tonight, but even up until before the show is still like, that's, that's hence the steak. It's like, I hear it's good to have if you're on the time of the month because you lose your blood, your irons and stuff. Um, so it does make you feel better to have that. So let me get to that and see if I can find something to watch. Maybe you watch more of that show from last night. I don't remember where I left off, but it's a it's a it requires a lot of mental mental focus. <laughs> I love you.